Hey everyone, welcome to Reason with Science. I'm your host, Jitendra. Our today's guest is Richard Nisbet. He is a professor emeritus of psychology at Michigan University. His research focuses on culture and reasoning. In this conversation, we discuss about his work in social psychology, mentors in scientific career, reward system in the society, unconscious reasoning, prejudice against women for tenured positions, rationality, free will, and measure of IQ in different cultures. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Thank you for listening. Okay, so hi, um, hi Richard, welcome to today's discussion. Thank you, glad to be here. Yeah, so, um, so your latest book when I was reading, and as you mentioned in the book, that it's a biography. So one uh, curious question that I had was that, when does someone decide to write a biography? Well, I don't, very few people do it at an early age. <laughs> uh, part of it is, you know, I've, I've been retired for a while um, and it's not easy to just stop working. So, and I, I had long thought to do that, but um, the book, I mean, it really does two things. The most important thing is that it surveys a lot of cognitive psychology and social psychology, <clears throat> uh, looking at them both in terms of the kinds of inferences people make, uh, the kinds of errors they make in inferences, uh, how much you can uh, reduce people's errors in reasoning. And actually, uh, I've, in the course of my research, over decades, I came to feel that um, the, the psychology profession uh, had been thinking quite wrong about intelligence, what it is and how we get it and how we can change it. <clears throat> so, and then with the, the personal things, the personal things fed into that uh, work. Um, and uh, so I thought there were some interesting connections between my life experiences and my work. Exactly. I mean, it's a, it's a, there are so many high, highs and lows in the book as, mm -hmm. as you were living in your early childhood uh, in right. the highs and lows of El Paso, uh, mm -hmm. which, which is quite interesting. But um, so after that, you went on to, to, uh, to study at Tufts University. Right. Um, and then uh, later on, your career continued at Columbia University. Yes, I did. For me, it was really uh, striking uh, to know that you got your first position at the age of 24. Right. Yeah, that so was never I, true in Europe. I mean, Europe, you know, had much longer education. For one thing, Europeans have one more year of, of uh, secondary school, of high school <clears throat> uh, than Americans. Um, and then I, by an accident, I graduated um, at uh, 17 rather than 18. So that's a couple of years right there. Um, but, and at that time, <clears throat> uh, it was a little bit unusual to have a PhD in four years, but not terribly unusual at all. Um, and it was uh, very common for people to get jobs in their mid twenties. Um, and, uh, now, you know, the, the Graduate school takes a year or two longer. People typically take a postdoc in my field for no good reason, um, but uh, except to get more publications uh, so that they can then get a better job. Uh, no one paid much attention to how many publications you had at that time. And for good or for ill, uh, it was an old boy network. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, if you were at a prestigious place uh, like Yale, you would say, well, and we want a social psychologist. Who's the best social psychologist in the country? Well, there are two, Festinger and Schachter. Uh, let's see if either of them has got uh, a good boy uh, this, this year. And it was definitely a male universe then, strictly. Uh, so Schachter said, yeah, I've got one, I've got a good one. So, so okay, let's hire him. 
So uh, it's now completely bureaucratic. Again, for, for good or for ill. I mean, <laughs> there are things to be said uh, in favor of the old boy network, though I would never return to it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if if I tell someone today that uh, ex scientists got a position at uh, at the age of twenty four, they would for sure think that uh, this person should be a workaholic. So, were you the same? Yeah, well, <clears throat> actually, it's quite interesting. I was certainly a workaholic in college. I, I was desperate to make a name for myself and uh, to get the best possible credentials. Uh, so I worked, I studied a 40 hour week and uh, that was a, a big loss because you don't learn twice as much when you study twice as much. In fact, it's not even clear you learn more than if you're just studying 20 hours a week uh, because you, know, you need time to digest uh, what you've been thinking about. You need relaxation time. Yeah, I was, I was meant to be. Uh, a workaholic from my, based on my ambition and based on the religion I grew up in, which is Protestant Calvinist uh, religion that, that tends to make people, either make people ambitious or makes them drop out one or the other. Uh, but I was spared from being an alcohol, uh, uh, an, um, a workaholic by uh, the fact that my advisor, who was a very, very successful social psychologist, only worked about, you know, a 35 hour week. He took the summers mostly off. Uh, he worked a half day and played a half day. <clears throat> and the other most distinguished person in my department was actually, I think, smarter in terms of sheer intellect than Schachter, uh, but much less accomplished in terms of his research, and he worked a 70 hour week. I mean, he was, so here I'm presented with this possible, here's this guy who's, you know, no genius, but has had a huge impact on the field and doesn't work very hard. And here's this other guy who's super smart and works like mad and hasn't had that big of an impact on the field. So sheer hard work uh, at that point didn't seem to me to be uh, the, the answer. And I'm so glad it was that way. I mean, it's um, work. All, you do better work. A, a lawyer acquaintance of mine who heads a law firm uh, told me that he forces his lawyers to take off uh, for vacation one month at least each year. He so says they'll be a better lawyer if they do that. And I Definitely believe that's true. Uh, it's, I mean, most of the advances in my thinking came when I was, you know, on holiday or, or, or being a visiting professor somewhere. <clears throat> so, um, hard work is fine. Workaholism is probably a bad idea for anybody. Interesting. I, I think many uh, newcomers they should listen to this advice and think about it. Um, and of course, in the in the scientific career, it's very important to have mentors, and especially in the era of bosses. Um, so what about your mentors? Did you did you get any? How, how uh, was your experience? Oh, well, Schachter was the best, certainly the best social psychologist to work with in the country. And it, it's actually very important. I mean, you really, it's very, very difficult to, good, to do good science unless you've been trained by a good scientist. And if you look at the situation from the outside, it says, well, you know, I mean, it is as if Schachter told his students, you do it this way, you don't do it that way. I mean, it, it, it wasn't a very explicit form of, of mentorship. It's just learning how hard you have to work on certain things uh, and what other things can be finessed, ignored, uh, and um, how to, to shape a problem. I mean, uh, people who didn't have good mentors 
uh, in psychology that I knew. They could be super, super smart. They knew as much or more than I did about the field, but they didn't know how to what, how to spot an important problem, how to, to um, knock it into shape so that it could be dealt with. Yeah. So in, in general, when we think of a, 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 sci a scientist, you know, a scientist chooses a problem, works on it, and of course, you want to find the answer of that problem. But sometimes it happens that you, you can't do it, right? Like maybe right. You, you, hit a, you hit a dead end. Um, right. so, so what was your experience during your um, early years? Well, I, I wonder if you're referring to the, the lesson I learned in my first semester of graduate school. Yes. I, I did a study. Um, it was my advisor's idea. Uh, and um, I got the data back. And we, it didn't seem to support the hypothesis. And I couldn't find much there at all. And I took it to Schachter. Uh, the data and the idea I said, you know, he was, he was known as a data wizard. I mean, he could find, he wasn't a very good statistician, but he was superb data analyst. He looked at it for about an hour, looked over the situation. And he says, well, I'm sorry, kiddo, you win some and you lose some. Uh, there's, there's nothing here. Uh, see you later. <laughs> uh, that's intolerable. I mean, I've spent a couple of months on that. This is my first big deal in graduate school, and it's a failure. So I'm going to work harder. I went back, dug further into the data, collected more data, and so on. And uh, the upshot was there was nothing there. <laughs> so I, I learned from that um, the concept of opportunity cost. Um, that was not free, that, that work I did. But that was stuff I did that that had no good outcome, had no plausible good outcome either. I should have known it was you know, probably not going to go anywhere. Um, and uh, I could have been doing something else. I was paying big opportunity costs uh, for for that. So, I mean, there are, there are expressions, you know, that convey that uh, in English. I imagine they exist in any language. One is know when to fold them, know when to hold them. Uh, and uh, oh, what are some of the others? Oh, there are two or three that, that, that mean uh, the same thing, that tell you uh, be ready to quit. Anyway, seeing my advisor, you know, just throw this thing away, say, you know, bye-bye, you know, go have, a, go have a cup of coffee. I mean, that, that taught me if something doesn't seem to be going very well, drop it. I mean, don't, you know, don't torture it for yourself. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, since we are talking about, um, you know, of course, the, the hard work in science and also uh, where to stop when you hit a dead end. Um, here, this interesting quote that I read in, the, in, in your book uh, from Hans Say who wrote that success in science is a multiplicative function of intelligence, education, ambition, curiosity, hard work, and ability to get along with people. Right. So do, do you think that you achieved all of them? Well, your experience? yeah, I was, you know, I, I have a very good example. I was pretty high on all of those things. And uh, I know so many people who, you know, in terms of raw smarts, I mean, how, you know, just how damn smart they are, smarter than I am. <clears throat> and they, they accomplished much less uh, than I did and much less than they might have. I mean, one, I know a guy uh, who has a tested IQ of 180. Um, and uh, <clears throat> he went to the University of Chicago in the 40s and 50s, and uh, it was the best university in the world at that time. Uh, <clears throat> most Americans, even most American academics don't know that, but it was. I mean, it was an incredibly exciting place. So he gets his PhD, actually, uh, 
Uh, I don't want to mention what field it was because I, that would tell some people who I'm talking about. Um, and uh, but then uh, in the course of his life, he had three uh, positions, academic positions at places that nobody had ever heard of. And he was he was very he was very socially inept. I mean, he, he could be quite irritating. He was a quite morally impressive person, but he was just a pain in the neck. Uh, and and uh, so, you know, he, he fell down on one of Sally's uh, criteria. Yeah. So the other thing that you uh, quite nicely mentioned is the, um, which is, of course, it's unfortunate, but I hope it's changing uh, this Pre prejudice against women um, yeah. during during your uh, tenure. So right, yeah. No, that's that's a huge difference. Uh, I mean, people were completely open about the prejudice. I mean, you know, you you get some woman applicant for a job and say, oh, you know, she'll probably be a baby farm. No, don't ignore that. Um, and my wife. Uh, was in graduate school at Yale um, and uh, in French literature. And it was the best French department in the country, bar none. And she, after I got my job at the University of Michigan, she went to talk to the chair of the Department of French <clears throat> uh, about the possibility of a job. And he said, oh, we, we think it's enough if the man has a job. You'd be sued today. <laughs> you'd be fired, <laughs> and you'd be sued, uh, which is a good thing. Um, but uh, no, it's there've been three periods about in the stature of women in the behavioral sciences. I don't know about other activities in in the world, but women were almost completely shut out uh, when I came into the business. Uh, of academics in the mid 60s. <clears throat> uh, within, I'd say, 10 years, uh, women and men were on an even footing uh, in terms of opportunities offered to them. Uh, and, and in fact, the, the, the field shift, the, the the professoriate shifted very much in a female direction during that period because talented women were getting jobs they deserved. <clears throat> and then there came a period, which we are in now, where there is a bias in favor of women. And uh, this is not, this is again in the behavioral sciences and actually even in engineering. Um, the uh, we know this as a result of so-called audit studies, economists call them, where uh, you, uh, you look at the mechanism of what's going on in academics. And you can give two, uh, you can give the same vita to people in economics, engineering, mm, psychology, and I don't know what the other field was, four different fields. Uh, and if of uh, the Vita, the resume, uh, has a female name on it, she is twice as likely to be interviewed than if it's a male name. So it's an extreme prejudice in favor of women now. <clears throat> and that's unfortunate. I mean, men in my field, men are tending not to come in. I mean, they know that the jobs are going to be very, very difficult to get. Uh, and speaking of workaholism, I mean, I'm told by people who are in psychology departments now <clears throat> that the male students are either extreme workaholics and you know, say, you know, you don't dare not hire me. I have 10 publications. Um, or they just drop out. Um, at, at one, at probably the number two department in the country for social psychology, um, they talk about the lost boys. That's a phrase from um, um, Peter Pan. Um, 
So um, he's he was head of the Lost Boys. Um, so it's a um, it's a very it's a very very different world. It was a it was a great world for a while. It was terrible before that period, and it's bad now. I mean, it's men are getting shut out. <clears throat> yeah but what do you think is the is the future of it i mean would it be always like the sigmoidal uh thing or at some point we can i don't know pass beyond the sex differences and uh just look for the the qualified people uh, for the job i don't think i don't see anything on the horizon that that's going to change um men have been oddly quiescent. I mean, uh, they, there's, I don't know anyone who, who fights it. It's just sort of not worth it. I mean, am I going to stand on a soapbox and say, we've got to have more even uh, uh, hiring practices? No, it's not worth it. So sort of like being a Republican in the US right now. <laughs> Shall I do the right thing? Oh, it's not worth it. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, so so let's let's start with your first project, uh, which was on obese people. Mm. And why 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 do they get um, or why they are obese? So uh, how was your experience to uh, work on this first project? Well, uh, Schachter uh, had the idea that maybe people some people. Um, misinterpret anxiety as hunger. And they, there was, they never found any support for that idea. But uh, the idea was maybe they become more sensitive to external cues, uh, more so good tasting food, good looking food, pleasant surroundings and so on, um, causes them to, to eat more uh, beyond uh, what they should. Um, but, and it did turn out that uh, fat people were more responsive to taste. It made a bigger difference in kind of an odd way. Basically, if the food was edible, <laughs> they ate much more than normal weight people. If it was, if, if you make people hungry uh, and give them really bad food, the normal weight people may eat it. Uh, obese people less likely to. Um, so this combination of uh, finickiness, of an odd kind of finickiness, and a failure to respond to uh, what would be hunger cues for the normal person, uh, fat people don't eat more after being deprived for a long time than they do after being deprived of food for very little time. Normal weight people do. <clears throat> One of the cute experiments I was involved in, it's not my idea, it was my student's idea. Uh, we uh, uh, caught people as they're entering the supermarket. We asked them, uh, how, um, how long has it been since you've eaten the meal? Uh, we tracked their carts. So we knew how much they had bought uh, when they, at the checkout counter. And sure enough, if it had been a long time, the normal weight people um, bought more groceries. I mean, wow, gee, that spaghetti looks good to me. <laughs> Put it in my cart. That was not true for fat people. Uh, but it isn't as if they, they weren't responsive. They were more likely to buy more food if they had eat, just eaten. Uh, I have no explanation for that. At any rate, <clears throat> the, the nature of the behavior was similar to that of, uh, of a preparation, as they call it in physiology, which you destroy the ventral medial hypothalamus, which is very much involved in uh, eating behavior. And these rats get fat, um, and uh, they, but they're finicky. Uh, they'll eat a huge amount of food, but only if it's pretty good. They won't eat bad food. Um, and uh, 
do they eat a lot, whether they, whether they just they've just had a meal or not. You put something attractive in front of them, they'll eat them, eat it, whereas the normal weight person won't. So I said, well, I began to think, well, hmm, is that what's going on with uh, with fat people? And one thing I found very quickly, there was a study of starving people in uh, uh, the U.S. and they were selected uh, uh, to be start to, to starve. They were volunteers. They were conscientious objectors who uh, didn't want to. Uh, they didn't want to be in the war. It was it during World War II? Uh, so they were offered a chance to do something for humankind, uh, starve, and like, we want to see what happens to you. And lo and behold, uh, they, they ate a huge amount of food, no matter how long they had been deprived. Uh, and they were finicky. Uh, they, they ate huge amounts of okay food, and they wouldn't eat bad food. I have an evolutionary explanation that, I mean, that, that uh, you don't want hunger to be such a powerful, overwhelming force that you'll eat the sawdust on the floor. I mean, it's just, so at any rate. Um, and I found that uh, there are uh, cells in the ventromedial hypothalamus which detect glucose level in the blood. And glucose level in the blood is a cue uh, tells you when you're hungry. And, uh, and if you destroy that, uh, you, you, you think you're hungry all the time. At any rate, so, well, so why are they fat? I mean, it's not, not, not necessarily because of that. They're fat, I think, because people, there's, there are some people ha who have more fat cells from birth or from very shortly after birth. Um, and uh, these people in rich societies are constantly hungry because they don't want to be fat. And uh, so they show these, the behavior of the starving person or of the rat with these lesions. So I never did any other, actually I did a fair amount of physiological work at that time of other kinds, psychophysiology, biopsychology, um, none of it paid off. And, uh, uh, and I had no mentor for that. I mean, I was, I was going to strike out on my own and pursue these ideas and you can't do it. Um, I mean, including in this particular case, by the way, <clears throat> I wanted to get rats with that ventral medial lesion. So I hired a graduate student to uh, uh, lesion this part of the brain and they didn't get fat. I said, oh, the guy must have done it wrong. Years later, I found out uh, that particular lesion has that effect only in female rats. <laughs> so, and if I had been in a lab, you know, which was working on feeding me, I would have known that. I would, I would not have tried to use it. So it's lots of ways to mess up if you, if you haven't been in an environment which teaches you how to, how to do it. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, the the other study or the other work that you did was uh, with with this pill or this was your obs observation with Sominex that uh, once you took and it didn't work for you. And um, yeah, so can you please elaborate uh, that study as well? Right. Well, I I had um, insomnia in college. Uh, it took me a long time to get to sleep, and I uh, would. Um, um, toss and turn, <clears throat> and uh, and then foolishly remain in bed. By the way, if you're an insomnia, but let me give a, your, your listeners a, a little tip about insomnia. <laughs> uh, there are several things you can do uh, to make it uh, like, first of all, go to sleep in a cool room. College dormitories, for some reason, I don't know, are heated to 120 degrees as of, you know, early uh, fall. Uh, and, um, uh, but keep your feet warm. Um, if after 20 minutes, you're not asleep, get out of bed and read a book. Don't, don't watch TV. That's a bad idea. That'll arouse you. 
Um, and once I would, I, this, all this information all comes via my mother who knew I was studying insomnia. <laughs> so she said, you know, here's a, an article from, I don't know, Ladies Home Journal or something. Um, but it's all, all correct. And I have not had insomnia since. But <clears throat> uh, so I, I said, well, OK, I, I hated the idea of taking any kind of drug. So I said, OK, I'll, I'll take a drug to get to sleep. So I took a Somonex. And the, the first night I took the Somonex, I lay there waiting for this blessed drug to do its work. Uh, and it wasn't doing it. And I was, you know, thinking about all my problems and, and the, the, the hour exam I hadn't studied enough for, the, the argument I had with my roommate the day before. <clears throat> and it took me even longer to get to sleep than usual. So I threw the Somonex out because uh, it wasn't helping. Years later, somebody told me Somonex is practically useless. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> it's not going to put you to sleep. So uh, I thought, and this, this comes from Schachter's theory uh, of emotion and anxiety. <clears throat> Suppose you gave people a pill and uh, told them it would put them, by people, I mean insomniac people who have trouble with that. So we advertised for a bunch of people like that, asked them how long it had taken them to get to sleep the two nights previously. We asked them to take a pill uh, called Suproxen, which was just a sugar pill. Um, <clears throat> and some of them we said, uh, we basically said it'll put you to sleep. We said it'll make make you relaxed, uh, your breathing rate will become slower, your body may cool down a bit. Um, so we've told them now something, there's something that ought to put them to sleep. Took them much longer to get to sleep, the two nights they took this pill. Other people we gave the pill to, and we said, um, this will um, increase your heart rate, make your breathing rate irregular. You may have a bit of sweaty palms, et cetera. So the, the symptoms that I had, and it turns out insomniacs in general tend to have uh, <clears throat> at bedtime. So it's gonna cause arousal at bedtime. These people got to sleep much quicker uh, than they had uh, the previous two nights. Um, and uh, this, this study, turned out to be, I mean, of course it had a huge impact. I mean, it has implications for therapy. It has implications for how we think about placebo and so on, uh, but no one could replicate it. And I didn't understand, never, never for a moment did I think that my data were wrong. So the guy who did the study with me said, oh, to hell with it. I, mean, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with these people, I'll do it and he couldn't replicate it. That still didn't make me think that that study had not worked. And sure enough, 20 years after that study was done, somebody told me, I know why you got that result with insomniacs and nobody else can. There's a test called the need for cognition. Turns out some people like to think all the time. That's, you know, as opposed to playing video games, you know, they, they uh, and some people are not that interested in thinking. This study was done at Yale, where people presumably have a high need for cognition. All the other studies were done at places uh, with, with, with less elite student populations. So. Yeah. And then um, you, you went on to work on uh, cognitive dissonance. <clears throat> well, I, I didn't really work on cognitive dissonance. Uh, I, uh, I, I did studies which were similar in some ways. By the way, I don't know if I made it clear from that, that, that anecdote. The guy had high need for cognition people and low need for cognition people in his insomniac study. The high need for cognition people showed the effects that we found and the low need for cognition people did not. Yeah. So um, the, because for me, the interesting thing was um, from the cognitive dissonance part, or at least the studies that you mentioned, 
the the reward based system in general i mean uh, this is what we see um, in schools or colleges that we um, even like the marking system which is used right um, so what's your comment on that is it uh, is it worth to use reward based system i mean i've been to many social events where they for example organize um, an event for a certificate for example so, so what, what's your comment on that? Yeah, organize an event for what? For, for certificates or to give out medals or something, <laughs> you know, like participation certificate, for example. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, I know why you tie cognitive dissonance to this question, because um, one of the main studies in the cognitive dissonance tradition <clears throat> was the insufficient justification paradigm. <coughs> uh, you uh, get people to do something they don't want to do, uh, like give a speech saying they favor marijuana uh, legalization, which they don't believe in, but you ask them to give this speech, please, and it will be shown to some freshmen in the college. Uh, and you either justify it by saying, we're going to give you, in today's terms, it would be like $200 if you would do that. <clears throat> um, and the other group, uh, you said you give them $5 uh, for doing that. Um, and the ones who are uh, given very little money to do this, to deliver this speech, uh, their attitudes shift in the direction of the speech. So in this case, they become more pro-legalization of marijuana. <clears throat> and, um, uh, but the people who are sufficiently justified in giving this speech and they per feel perfectly comfortable, they don't have any discomfort about having said this stuff, they were well paid, thank you. They don't show any shift. <clears throat> So for some reason, uh, at some point, I said, well, that's insufficient justification. If you have insufficient justification for behavior, uh, you, you move uh, in that direction. You, if you insufficiently justified speech, you move in the direction of the speech so that you don't feel someone says, isn't that I'm a liar, it isn't that I'm, you know, I, you can be, you know, buy me off. It's that I, I really do believe this, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> so I said, well, what happens if you uh, give overly sufficient justification for somebody? You pay them for doing something they would want to do anyway. Um, so uh, we decided to test this with little kids in nursery school. Uh, and um, the nursery school had a table at the front of the classroom where the special um, uh, toys, the new toys were put out. So uh, we put out uh, magic markers, which are now common as dirt, but at that time they were very rare. Um, and uh, we observed how much each kid played with the magic markers uh, for several days of observation. <clears throat> Then the magic markers are removed. Uh, and uh, two weeks after they had initially been put out, um, a, a nice man approaches each of the kids and told, <clears throat> there's a nice man here today at nursery school uh, who's interested in the kinds of pictures that kids draw. Um, and uh, he would, like it if you would draw with these magic markers for him. Uh, would you be willing to do that? That's one condition. And the other condition, uh, he would like you to do that. And if you do, he could give you a good player award and you show him a certificate saying good player award and there's a gold seal and a blue ribbon hanging down. The kid says, yeah, that'd be great. So a week or two after that, you 
put the table, they put the magic markers out on the table again. The kids who were uh, not offered pay uh, for doing that uh, spent twice as much time playing with the magic markers than kids who had gotten an award uh, for doing it. So that, that's what you can, you can call a, a demonstration proof. That is, there is such a thing as rewarding people for behavior that they would enjoy behaving uh, in any way. Uh, and if you do, you know, they, you've take, somehow you've taken the fun out of it. You've, you've turned play into work. Oh, magic markers. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's, what, that's something I do for awards. <laughs> There's no awards today. So <clears throat> it's not clear how much to people have demonstrated that point in a huge different, a hugely different number of domains. There are some constraints where it doesn't work. <clears throat> if the award uh, is given in proportion to how good the work is, uh, you know, otherwise people would say, wait a minute, these, these, uh, these executives who are paid a million dollars a year to run their companies, they, they hate it because they're so heavy. No, no, they don't. They treat that reward as, a, as an indicator of how good they are at their job. So there are lots of constraints on it, but I do think it's a bad idea to tell a child you'll give them money for reading. For reading. I mean, reading is intrinsically a, a, attractive to most people. And if you tie it to this extrinsic reward, it's now something they do for the extrinsic reward. And if that isn't available, they're not that interested in doing it. So I think the, the point is you have, to, you have to be careful. I mean, there are some cases where reward is effective in getting good behavior and some cases where it's not. And I, I don't think it's ever been worked out exactly uh, when you can be pretty sure it's a bad idea. Um, to reward uh, good behavior. Yes, exactly. I mean, these things, they have uh, huge implications on the society as well, the way, in, uh, um, the, the way we work. So the, the other thing which, uh, which was striking and uh, again, have that implication on the society, uh, which comes from your lab, um, the, the work on unconscious problem solving. Right. Uh, yeah, that's that's just f fascinating, and how much uh, sort of clashes or like the the resistance that you face from the the, the scientific community. Right. <clears throat> well, my a lot of my research had showed me that people are going through cognitive processes and have absolutely no idea that they those those thoughts went through their head. So I asked the insomnia, I said, see, gee, I, I, it's interesting. Oh, so you slept, I, I don't, looking back, I see you, you got to sleep quicker um, the last two nights than you had the two nights before you came in. Why do you suppose that is? I don't know, things are going better with my girlfriend. You know, I got, a, I got an A on my history exam. Yeah, okay. Um, well, I was wondering, um, did you did you think about uh, the pill uh, that you had taken uh, at all? No, not really. I just took the pill. No, I oh, I see. Well, let me tell you what I thought. I thought that if I gave you a pill, uh, which you thought was making you aroused, you would lie down in bed, you're getting a little bit aroused, you're worried about that hour exam, and you, you can feel yourself being uh, you know, worked up, and you'd say, oh, yeah, but I took this pill that's causing that. And the subjects would say, oh, well, you know, I, I'm sure it could have worked that way for some people, but I, honest to God, I, I never thought about the pill uh, after I got it. <clears throat> Those kids in nursery school have no idea. You, you could say, do you realize that the the, <laughs> the, the reason you played with those magic markers was because you got a reward. And then you began to think about playing with mag magic markers as something you do to get rewards. And when the magic markers were out, you know, the, the kid has no idea why 
he is as interested as he. And in cognitive dissonance studies, cognitive dissonance studies only work because you don't know what's going on. Um, you don't know that you changed your attitude because you did something in, unpleasant uh, in, re, in relation to that attitude. So we started just demonstrating things in the laboratory. <clears throat> um, for example, uh, we would have them um, list, oh, this, <laughs> this example makes, probably doesn't make, quite make sense uh, for people in your country, but I, I, can, I can handle that problem. <laughs> So we have them memorize word pairs like, you know, butter, uh, dog, uh, bank, uh, bus. Um, and in there, there we in that list uh, of, of um, word pairs they're learning, we include something like uh, ocean, moon, that pair. You say, thank you very much. Uh, we have the second experiment, as we told you, that we'd like you to do. And uh, we just want to ask you questions, and we want you to just answer, you know, as, as, uh, um, as best you can. Uh, what comes to mind when I ask you about a, a laundry detergent? What pops into your head? Now, I don't know if... In your country, the detergent called Tide exists. It does. Uh, it's, oh, there is. Oh, okay. So the, the, the kids who have uh, memorized the word pair ocean moon are much more likely to mention Tide than some other laundry detergent and so on. For We slip these words in and we know it's going to set off a train of associations that will prime them so that when we come up, so, and it will affect the way they answer these questions. Now, if you ask somebody, say, well, I mean, you came up with tide, I just and you came up with a tide as your example, why is that? And say, well, I don't know, it's, it's the best known detergent, or my mom uses tide, or I like the tide box. Um, so <laughs> they have no idea that this word pair ocean moon has primed them so that they're gonna think about tide. So we have like a dozen experiments like that. The very best experiments showing that unconscious process, that a lot of the cognitive processes are unconscious were not done in our laboratory. They were done by somebody else. This one was done in um, Poland. Was it Poland? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, you uh, you give show people a matrix, four boxes, and you uh, this is on a computer screen, and you put an X in one of those boxes. But first, you ask the subject, "Where do you think the X is going to appear?" And of course, for the first few, tile, few tries, uh, uh, it's totally random. They're, they, they, if they, they're just as likely to say it's going to come up in box one, uh, or it didn't, it isn't going to come up as in box four. But the trick is that there are an extremely elaborate set of rules that determine where that X is going to appear. An X never appears in the same box twice in a row. Uh, an, uh, an X never appears in box number one until it's previously uh, been seen in box number four twice in a row. I mean, very complicated in instructions. And people are getting better and better at this <laughs> because they've learned, they've learned, without any knowledge at all, they've learned the rules that determine what that, where that X is going to appear. And we, we know that's what's going on because when we change the rules, their, their guessing becomes random again. Uh, and so you say, gee, you were doing so well there for a while, and, and then you kind of lost it. Uh, why is that? Say, so, well, I, and some of, many of the subjects were psychology professors. 
And they would say things like, well, I think maybe you were putting subliminal messages on the screen to confuse me. <laughs> they can't tell you. And then my favorite one comes from my biggest critic on this work, whose work was you know, it's kind of made less plausible. He would ask people to solve problems and think aloud. Think I'm going to do this, and maybe this X, and and people were typically right about. It. I mean, he knew that they were using the cognitive processes that he said. So he said, "It's great. People can can watch their cognitive processes." Uh, and he, this the guy was ultimately a Nobel Prize winner uh, for economics. Uh, and uh, psychology and political science. He was everything, very, very smart guy. Um, but when he gave a, a colloquium about this at Stanford, somebody says, oh, Dick Nisbet has shown that kind of work as a crock. Um, that is, it, it doesn't show what that people can observe their cognitive process. It just shows they have a theory about what they're doing and that theory happens to match what actually is going on in their heads, but they're not observing their cognitive processes. I don't think he ever understood <laughs> why my work showed that his work um, was not demonstrating what he had hoped, but he gave me the best example I've ever had of consciousness and cognitive processes. He says, you know, the first time a person plays a game of chess, <clears throat> uh, they, they play the game, they lose if they're playing somebody who actually knows how to do it. And if you say, tell me what, what rules um, did, were you following? I don't know, I just was moving the pieces around. I mean, uh, you say, well, I noticed at one point you put your knight at risk uh, and, uh, and you got a rook uh, because the person took the bait. Uh, why did you do that? I don't know. I just, just, I thought I just put it. I just, I just kept them moving. That's all. I mean, uh, and the, the man's name is Herbert Simon. I mean, I, I don't know if he's known to any of your listeners, but uh, um, they're actually using a strategy. It's called duffer strategy, beginner's strategy. Everybody uses the same rules. They don't know what they're doing. Then if a person gets serious about chess, starts playing with good players and talking to them about it and reading books about it and so on and see, watching games, they now are completely articulate about why they did what they did. Uh, <clears throat> they are, you know, they, if, they, if they did X, you know they did it because they were following a particular rule and they tell you what the rule is because there are, there are rule books <laughs> and they've learned these things. But if the person continues beyond that <clears throat> and becomes uh, a, a master chess, chess player, he's no longer accurate about what he's doing because the, the, the rules that he learned in this arduous way, memorizing it from a book, he's sort of forgotten what the, you know, it no longer has an explicit rule about that. He's just doing it implicitly. He does those things. And the things that make him a master are rules that he's invented, that he's induced for himself, maybe and maybe not articulate. So uh, duffers and masters can't tell you what's going on in their heads accurately when they play chess. It's only the intermediate level people who can do that. So these are two, two of my favorite uh, supports uh, for the idea that we can't observe cognitive processes. There's one other point that I would make here. We had a, the article went to Psychological Review, which is the most uh, pre prestigious journal in psychology. And it was very long uh, because we had done lots and lots of experiments. We had lots of, of well, we had several killer studies like the X's in the matrix uh, study. It was very long. Two of the reviewers say so it's too long. You know, the article's too long. One of the reviewers was Danny Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize for economics. Uh, and uh, 
I did not know him at the time, but he said, uh, the article must remain at its current length because it completely kills the idea. You know, it just can't hit you over the head. Example after example, it will, it, will, it will kill a certain idea in psychology if you leave it at that length. So fortunately, the editor went with him and we didn't change the length at all. Now you would actually ask about the reactions to it. Experimental psychologists um, threw in the towel. No, we had nobody except Herbert Simon, who was sort of an experimental psychologist. He was the only experimental psychologist who tried to say our work does not prove that people can't observe their cognitive processes. Uh, and um, uh, but there were two types of people who 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 did object. One was clinical psychologists, because they well, they think they're in the business of showing people what their cognitive processes are, learning to look inside themselves and see they're not. Uh, good therapists are teaching people rules about how to behave, uh, and. Uh, but people don't even necessarily know that they're using those rules. I mean, um, so the other is philosophers. Philosophers couldn't stand this. I mean, because philosophers' stock and trade is, here is what we're thinking when we do this. And you say, well, how do you know that, Mr. Philosopher? Well, I just look inside my head. I just think, nope, sorry. Uh, and that, it took, I don't know, many years before at least the best philosophers had, had threw in the towel. They said, oh, okay, we don't examine our cognitive processes. We just have theories about what our, our cognitive processes are, which are sometimes right and sometimes wrong. Yeah, and today it's quite obvious. I mean, I, it, it's widely accepted that uh, most of the time, the things that we do, we are unconscious of uh, uh, mm -hmm. these things. I mean, for example, I go and play ping pong and uh, no one or whosoever seen the, the actual ping pong game uh, will never say that they are playing it consciously. It, it's always most of the moves are unconscious right. in, in, right. in that you don't have You don't have time to say, oh, it's coming over there and it's a certain angle and I'm in exactly. no, it's just <laughs> let her rip. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, and interestingly, that the one of the philosopher was Dan Dennett, who who commented on your work, uh, right. and that's surprising because I mean, of course, nowadays his theory is the the information theory, where he says that uh, consciousness is an illusion. So uh, <laughs> I didn't know he said that. Now, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's what like uh, yeah. Now his theory is of the consciousness, right? Yeah. Um, so. So how, how do, I mean, because this thing now, once we also related with COVID-19, the pandemic, how people have behaved or they are behaving in, in terms of getting data, information and everything. So how do people reason? How do people make judgments about the world? Um, you mean with consciously versus unconsciously? Or? Yes. Like in, in general, how, how do we uh, sort of um, take some data and, uh, you know, access it in a way that um, do we have certain biases? Are we working with those biases? I mean, sort of the work that you already mentioned of uh, uh, Danny Kahneman and uh, uh, Tversky that they, they were working on those similar concepts, right? Right. Yeah, yeah they, they were they were certainly aware that their subjects don't know about these biases. They don't know that these biases are what uh, are what's causing their behavior. Um, so um, yeah, so Danny Kahneman was the perfect reviewer uh, for our paper because he knew all that. he knew that paper. <laughs> so he said, "Ah, oh, it's nice that somebody's." saying what I know to be true, which is that many cognitive processes, although we, we actually, our, our position was quite radical. We said there's no such thing as observing your cognitive processes. 
I mean, what is it that you know? You know what you were thinking about. You know what uh, you know what some of the salient objects were. Uh, you uh, you you recall having a particular kind of idea, but uh, this is not the same as observing your cognitive processes. I mean, that's uh, you were making inferences about what your cognitive processes must have been if you came up with this particular conclusion. And it's interesting because people, no one claims to have the ability to see how their perceptual apparatus works. And he said, how, how did you tell me? You, you, you say that that, that that patch of color there is red. How did you, how did you do that? <laughs> Nobody pretends to have, to have access to perceptual processes. And nobody claims to have access to memory processes. I mean, it's just as well, I you know, I'm going oof and pow, there it is. It's in my head. I don't know what I did. I don't know what the processes were that, that, that allowed me to bring up that memory. But we, we don't really, it's very, it's people re react quite negatively to the idea that they can't observe their thinking processes. I mean, they're often right about their cognitive biases, no question about that, but it's because they have a theory uh, that uh, happens to correspond uh, to what actually went on in their heads. Yeah. And what do you think about rationality then? Are, are we rational? Uh, I mean, it's easy to point <laughs> to cases of, of irrationality, <clears throat> especially in other people. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> although I'm, I'm certainly aware, and I think everybody is, of, of, of some ir of my own irrationalities. Um, I mean, I, when I was, up until, I don't know, my mid twenties, uh, if I started a book, I was determined to finish it. Now, why is that? <laughs> I mean, there is no rational answer to that question. And, and of course, it's a foolish habit to have. I, I polled an audience for the first time the other day. I was giving a talk and I asked, how many of you used to feel like you had to finish a book if you started? I'd, I'd say about 20% of the people. Uh, in the audience, <laughs> now, that's irrational. It's absolutely irrational. I don't. If you ask me, so why did I? Why did I feel that? Because I didn't want to be a quitter. Uh, I, <laughs> uh, because you know somebody had told me the book was good, and you know maybe they didn't like the first fifty pages themselves, but they came to. I, I have. I can't. I can't. I mean, I, I, by now. I've, I've given up. I, I, there is no, I don't know why I did it. And I think it's, it's completely irrational. No redeeming virtues for that practice. Opportunity costs. I'm reading the story of mechanics, which I'm never going to be any good at anyway. And I'm reading it because I started it. Uh, so, so. <laughs> but I mean, uh, and I'm sure my wife can point to many of my irrationalities that I would deny. Uh, and, would, <laughs> and you, the observer, could decide who's, who's right about my rationality or irrationality. <clears throat> exactly. I mean, generally, rationality is also connected with the emotions. So, you know, maybe you are too emotional, less rational, etc. So right. what's, what's your view on that? Um, actually, in psychology, I'm Mr. Anti-Emotion. Uh, I think, uh, I, especially as concerns uh, unfortunate behavior and foolish ideas, um, I think <clears throat> emotion, of course, emotion can make us irrational, but you know, we, we can be so irrational about so many things without the emotions being in, involved. If I tell you, here's a, a, a young woman in college, she was uh, uh, a, a debater and uh, she, uh, uh, she was uh, 
uh, outspoken uh, in, in, in her classroom situation. She's now a bank teller. Um, no, I want you to tell me wh which is more likely for this woman, that she is a bank teller or that she is uh, a bank teller uh, with, who's active in politics. And people say, oh, it's more likely that she's a bank teller who's active in politics than it is that she's a bank teller. <laughs> That's impossible. That's completely impossible. Um, a, a, an example of, of, of a type of a category can't be more common than every type in that category. So, uh, <clears throat> um, so and then emotion has nothing to do with that irrationality. Or people are um, people are not good at formal logic. I mean, um, it's it's if you, you say all A's are B, X is a B, is it an A? Yeah, mm -hmm, sure, right. Nope, <laughs> that's not that, that's not a, a, a valid conclusion. Um, no emotion involved there, just, you know, inadequate formal logic apparatus in the brain. <laughs> yeah, but then what does, or how we explain free will if we have this concept? How do we, how do we explain? Free will, like, does it, does it exist? Are we, do we have those rights to decide whatever we are trying to decide? You know, I, I have always resisted um, addressing that question. Uh, and I, now you ask me, why do you resist? I don't know. <laughs> ask my wife. She's as likely to know as I am. I think that a part of the reason that I don't like to think about free will is it's obviously a very hard problem and no one has ever claimed successfully to have come up with the answer to that. So, you know, I'm a pretty smart guy, but smarter people than I am have thought about that question for millennia and they have not come up with an answer. So I'm, you know, I'm gonna treat it like that first study I did in graduate school. It's, I'm not gonna pay the opportunity cost. I can think of other things where I might have a chance of solving it. So I've never, no. However, I mean, I, I, a somewhat more responsive answer to what you're saying is that the work I've done and other people as well in psychology, um, make it clear that not all of the choices we make are made because of things that we can control. I mean, a lot of stuff is out of control. I mean, if you uh, people, if people vote, uh, in a school in the U.S., you can vote in the courthouse, or sometimes it's schools, sometimes it's churches. <clears throat> People who vote in a school are more likely to approve the new uh, high school building for the town uh, <clears throat> than if they vote in a church. If they vote in a church, they're more likely to vote against abortion than if they vote in a school. <clears throat> So people think that the whole process by which they've come to a conclusion about what should be done about the high school, they think that's a matter of choice that's been based on things they know and have thought about. And of course it is to a degree, uh, but uh, the part about your voting in the school, you didn't have a choice for that. <laughs> and that went into the, into the choice that you made. Uh, so we, my work and others shows that we're bombarded by stimuli all the time, which are influencing us and we're not aware of it. We may be correct, but it's because we have a theory uh, about uh, why I would think that. It's not because I observe 
the process um, by which I came to believe something or came to behave in some way. Yeah, I think some major implications of this understanding is, so let's say that we are unconscious most of the times. I mean, of course, at certain times we can be conscious. Mm -hmm. Of course, we are irrational, uh, we can say that. Um, but I think the, you know, this, this sort of, to, to take some credit for the advancement of humanity, which of course humans have done it uh, for themselves, at least. Uh, that we have science, electricity, technology, et cetera, et cetera, all, the, all those different things. So that sort of um, thing comes from us, from, from certain subjectivity, right? That we can do it at, or like we have done it or we have achieved it. So once we take away that, uh, you know, message from, of course, our understanding of, of the psychology, I think this is where it, it sort of um, creates that gap in the society. Does, does it make sense or? Wait, what creates the gap? I'm sorry. Like the, the, the understanding that um, we are sort of irrational and we, most of the, the work that we, or the actions that we are taking, they are unconscious, right? Uh, the means it, because then the whole narrative loses the subjectivity it means it's like just the universe is guiding itself. It's not like we are doing something um, important in, in our um, intellectual journey. Right. Well, I certainly think, you know, we do important things. You mentioned some of the tremendously important things that are <coughs> um, very much involved with the conscious mind, but they're also very much involved with the unconscious mind. Um, <coughs> there's a book. Um, by Brewster Gieselin, G-H-I-S-E-L-I-N, um, on the creative process. And he collected uh, scores of uh, narratives from famous people who had accomplished very important things um, and asked them uh, how... And the, the and they report in their in their writings uh, how they came up with these ideas, and Gieselin says it it virtually never do they claim that it was the result of a cognitive process. So um, the mathematician, um, oh, what's his name? French the Pope name name a French mathematician, great mathematician, <clears throat> not Laplace. Um, Poincaré. <clears throat> uh, Poincaré says, you know, I was on vacation. At the moment I put my foot on the step of the bus, it occurred to me that the Fuchsian functions that I had used to solve a certain problem would work for this problem I've been dealing with for months now. That he was thinking about the cows and the grass. He went in and it, pow, it, the, the answer to an important problem comes into his head. Or the poet, uh, Amy Lowell, uh, says, I was in a, a, a gallery once and I saw a nice sculpture, bronze sculpture of horses. And I thought, gee, the, the bronze horses, that, that might make a good subject for a poem sometime. Six months later, she sits down and starts writing out the poem as if she's taking dictation. <laughs> she said, the poem was there. <laughs> um, and I think most people have had experiences like that. I mean, they're just out of the blue, you know, I want, I, suddenly they've solved a problem. And this gets to, I think, almost the most well, important question I've ever worked on is, um, what what is the conscious mind good for? I mean, we don't. We can solve problems clearly um, by unconscious processes. Um, and the best I can say is that if you if there's a problem you want to solve, you've got to attend to it in a very conscious way. What are the elements? What's the outcome you're looking for? 
etc. Prepare the ground and then hand it over to the unconscious, um, and the unconscious uh, may may well solve the problem. Um, but we don't have a, a clear idea of what kinds of problems need how much conscious work. We do know that some problems <coughs> are better solved by the unconscious mind than by the conscious mind. So that if you ask people to choose between two apartments that they might rent, you give them a dozen different dimensions, cost and attractiveness, et cetera. And you dump all that information in the very quickly, just rattling off the properties of these apartments and say, which do you think, which do you think you'll take? You make a better choice than if you're allowed to think about the problem for 30 minutes. So the conscious mind messes things up. My colleague and all the work on conscious consciousness, <clears throat> Tim Wilson, has many demonstrations of how the conscious mind will mess things up. Uh, the, the unconscious mind is, is, is better. Uh, and I don't know that he has generalizations. I don't think he does have good generalizations about the kinds of problems which benefit from, uh, from unconscious work. But you know, this is not a radical idea. I mean, people, are, people say, well, I want to sleep on that. Right, you do. Uh, if it's an important choice and it doesn't immediately pop into your head what should be done, then, you know, turn away from it for a while. Let the unconscious mind take over. Yeah. Um, because this also sort of uh, questions the, you know, as, as you mentioned, evil in the world, uh, which are motives, right? Um, because if most of the work and uh, work has been done by the unconscious mind, then how do we explain motives that to do certain things, right? Or what we what we have been discussing. I'm not. I'm not sure what the what the question is. I'm sorry. <clears throat> yeah. So here I was just uh, trying to say that uh, because this still questions the motives of. To do certain tasks, I mean, which what uh, whatever we were discussing like now after uh, before uh, the, the the previous question, but um, the the question which I wanted to go for uh, is is from your latest work um, on culture culture differences. Mm -hmm. So starting with um, northern and southern uh, differences that you you've noticed, um, I mean, of course. This this thing is worldwide. Everywhere we can go and we can find these differences with, between northern uh, culture or southern culture. They they there are always this. Uh, they, there are these soft tussles between northern and southern people. Mm -hmm. So so what are your observations uh, from from um, the differences well, between northern and southern cultures? Actually, it isn't. My theory is not about northern versus southern cultures. It, in Europe, it's certainly true. The Mediterranean is a culture of honor. Uh, the key story in Western thought uh, is a, a culture of honor thing. It's um, uh, King Creon, whoever it was, going after his wife, who's been stolen uh, by some, somebody in Troy. The Trojan War was fought over, some, over somebody's taking somebody else's wife. <clears throat> um, and uh, that seemed a perfectly reasonable thing to risk your life for. Uh, somebody else's wife got stolen. So <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, that's a culture of honor story. Um, and um, the Iliad is the book, of course, that comes out of that. Um, and um, no, the key thing is whether, uh, is the occupation. If the occupation is hurting, <clears throat> you're going to have a culture of honor. Uh, and that's because if your livelihood is at great risk, if you're a herder, because your, your, your entire wealth is in that herd, 
And if somebody steals a, a sheep, you know, you, that's a very significant matter, let alone um, if your wealth is in your horses and somebody lets down the bar for your, um, uh, for the, your, the compound where you keep the horses and, and now he has all the horses and you don't. Uh, so how do you deal with that? And the answer is by acting tough, by making it clear that if you, if you insult me, if you make fun of me in any way, you're going to pay a serious price. I mean, I'm going to attack you physically or kill you. Uh, and uh, all cultures which depend on herding have that culture of honor. Some of those cultures are pretty far north. I mean, people who herd reindeer, I mean, <laughs> they are culture of honor. Uh, so it's not, it's not really, it's not north-south. It's herding, herding, non-herding. So... Uh, and um, so recently also you've been working on uh, wisdom or uh, right. trying to figure out what is wisdom. So what is the difference between intelligence and wisdom? Yeah, well, it's um, actually, <clears throat> there's a pretty straightforward answer to that. And that is that in every culture, um, basically wisdom refers to intelligent thought with benign intent. I mean, Hitler was an intelligent man, uh, but uh, his intents were not benign. Uh, and um, <clears throat> it's, so it's, it, it's, that's the, the basic idea is yes, it's, it's, it's um, thinking about uh, the welfare of some of your fellow human beings in a way that will improve their situation. Um, so, and I, I'm, I'm not one to want to turn over a thousand years of definition of wisdom because that's what it's always been. Yeah. And so what do you, what do you think about the um, IQ uh, factors that we use nowadays to, to measure right. intelligence? Well, there was a book that was written a long time ago that became what most people believed about intelligence. Uh, it was all about IQ. Uh, it said that IQ is substantially heritable. Um, 60 percent or more of the variation in a given population is owing to genes. <clears throat> um, early childhood experiences don't much affect uh, IQ. Um, the, uh, you can't make people smarter really by, I mean, school doesn't have I mean, much effect uh, on IQ. Uh, there are differences between blacks and whites uh, in IQ, and those are partly genetic. That difference is partly genetic in origin. Uh, there's uh, good evidence. There's good reason to believe uh, that Asians may have higher IQs uh, genetically uh, based <clears throat> than uh, Euro people of European e extraction. And all of that except one thing is wrong. <laughs> uh, the uh, US blacks have lower IQs than US whites. But my first uh, foray into the question of IQ uh, uh, satisfied me that the IQ difference between blacks and whites in the US owes nothing to genes. There's actually quite, quite good evidence about it. Um, and, uh, and it comes mostly from a natural experiment that 20% uh, of the genes in the black population in the US are European. 
That means that there are some blacks in the US with 100% African genetic uh, origins and some with mostly European origins. Now, if the black white IQ difference is owing in part to genes, then those heavily European blacks ought to have higher IQs than the pure African blacks. And that's not the case. I mean, no matter how you measure it, by features, by blood groups, uh, by, um, uh, in, by uh, we now have some you know, genetic markers. It, it's, uh, it, there's, no, there's no difference between uh, uh, people who are blacks who are mostly European and blacks who are mostly African. So, uh, so all the and, and, and by the way, the, if, if this is if it's true that there's no genetic contribution, then we would expect that as the economic situation and the social situation of blacks has improved, the IQs would be improving too, and that's the case. The IQs have increased by six or eight points uh, in the last uh, generation. <clears throat> so. Um, anyway, the rest is all wrong. I mean, genes are, of course, important to IQ, uh, but um, uh, genes are much more, it's, there's a, uh, a, a difference between Northern European countries and the US in terms of uh, the genetic contribution to IQ. It's actually higher in general in Northern European populations than it is in the US. In the US, <clears throat> uh, for people who are in the lower socioeconomic status, uh, the uh, IQ uh, is not influenced by genetic makeup. Uh, for upper middle class people, IQ is largely uh, genetic. Uh, now, why would that be the case? Well, because Dr. Smith and Lawyer Jones uh, create pretty much the same environment for their kids, uh, and if the environment and it's a very good environment for in terms of nurturing IQ, <clears throat> uh, and if the environment is constant, doesn't differ much in a population, genes are going to be driving the bus. So IQ for upper middle class people, differences in IQ for upper middle class people are largely genetic. There's In the US, there's no genetic contribution, virtually no genetic contribution to IQ for the bottom 15 or 20% of the population socioeconomically. <clears throat> now, why would that be? Well, uh, in the lower class uh, in the US, you're gonna find some families that are as, provide as good environments as any upper middle class family would, and some environments which are chaotic and disruptive in every respect. <clears throat> and when you have that much environmental difference, it's the environment that'll be driving the bus. Now, interestingly, it looks like that's not true in Northern Europe. There isn't a social class difference or very little social class difference in the degree to which IQ is genetically determined. And I think, but I don't know, it's because the uh, social safety net is much stronger in Northern Europe than it is in the US. Uh, I mean, they, um, they just see to it that people aren't terribly impoverished. In Scandinavia in particular, very strong egalitarian spirit. You just don't let people sink. You find a way to, to keep them up, to keep their environment and therefore their children's environment uh, optimal. That's, that's speculation. The, the facts are there, I mean, in terms, but, but I don't, we don't really know for a fact uh, why it is that uh, you get this difference 
in the social classes in the US and not in Northern Europe. Um, but uh, uh, the, the idea that school is not important to IQ, it, it, it's, it's crazy. I mean, none of the people for 50 or 60 or 70 years, they were saying school doesn't do anything for your IQ. Now, there's two problems there. One is IQ tests were designed to not, specifically not include the kind of information that you get in school. So they, they didn't ask you about, you know, the structure of the atom or uh, uh, the dates of the French Revolution. I mean, it's stuff that um, you think is not learned in school, but in fact, um, it, uh, it is. You, I, you can't be smart without IQ. Basically, um, a year of school is worth a year of age in terms of, of, your, of your IQ. So uh, eight-year-olds well, uh, who had a, a year of, 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 of school uh, have uh, the IQ, uh, have their eight-year-old IQ. If you have an eight-year-old who didn't get to go to school, and it's a natural experiment because he was born after the cutoff date, that kid is only as smart as the other ones who went to school, is only as smart as they were when before they went to school. Um, and uh, uh, so you, you have to have school. I mean, there's a, uh, there's a, a study done with African kids who had had no school, or eight or nine or 10 year old kids, they were given a, a, the so-called culture-free IQ test, um, which uh, it's just, you know, figuring out what rules determine shape changes. Uh, and the kids had extremely low IQs with that test. After three or four months of grammar school, they did they got IQs that were 10 points higher. I mean, and they were, they were not shown anything specifically about that. It's just <clears throat> how to work with relatively abstract materials is something that gets taught very early uh, in, uh, in education. <clears throat> so it turns out that <clears throat> the way people were thinking about school is wrong. The way people were thinking about early childhood experiences are wrong. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't get these social class differences uh, in the extent to which uh, genes are influencing IQ. But that's all in my book called Intelligence and How to Get It. Um, more recently, I've come to think that IQ type skills, they're, they're just one type of skill. I mean, uh, they're real. Uh, the college seminar, you know, you're going to know which are the ones with, you know, to some degree of accuracy, which are the ones with the highest IQ, but you're not going to know which are the ones who can do an experiment properly. <laughs> uh, and you're not going to know which ones are going to rise rapidly in a business corporation. Um, those pragmatic intelligence skills are quite distinct from IQ type skills. And, you know, uh, President Trump had basically knew nothing about government, uh, doesn't know a lot about anything, to tell you the truth, but certainly not about government. And when people say, well, well you know, you don't have any experience with government, how are you going to handle this? Says, I have a giant brain. I say, you know, well, that may be true, uh, but you're not gonna be effective in government on the basis of your raw intelligence. You need to know how to persuade someone to vote for your bill, or you need to know what kind of, of activity is likely to be uh, destroyed by the opposition party and so on. It's, it's knowledge-based uh, um, skills are, <clears throat> are crucial to, uh, to being able to, to govern or to run a corporation. <coughs> um, 
So uh, I think that knowledge is much more, I, I think I put much heavier weight on knowledge and pragmatic intelligence, which overlaps only very partially with IQ. Exactly. I think this makes more sense. And so probably we can have two comments there. One is that the environment is as important as uh, as genes. I mean, like we, we need to change or evolve in the environment to get more or to grow in, in terms of IQ. Mm -hmm. And as you said, that knowledge and pragmatic attitude is uh, also important because, I mean, you may be able to solve or work on, uh, for example, uh, quantum mechanics, et cetera, or you know, to, to work on major difficult problems in science. But um, when the time comes and you just don't go and get vaccinated, what's the point? So <laughs> right. you know, to, to, to have that, that, that aptitude to understand what is important for the survival as well. Right, well, that's, it's compete the attitude of Westerners toward vaccination. <clears throat> it, it's astonishing to me. I mean, 20% of the population in the US, I mean, the, the, they're, they're thinking like an idiot. I mean, it's just, you know, I say, I don't want to knock, I don't want to get a vaccination because I heard about this guy who had the vaccination and he had slowly, after that, had complete organ failure. You say, okay, well, that's one person. And then there are 800,000 people who didn't have the vaccination who are dead. So that's 800,000 to one. Now, that's the only sensible way to think about that. So I don't, the, predict, the stupidity there is, it's beyond me. I mean, in the US, it's a little more understandable in the US than it is in Europe, uh, because there's this fetish of freedom uh, in the US. You say, oh, my freedom, you know, my freedom to, you know, to drive without uh, a safety belt if I want to, and make you pay if I have an open head injury, closed head injury. They make you pay hundreds of thousands of dollars because I went through the windshield of my car because I wasn't wearing my seatbelt. <clears throat> there are different subcultures, by the way, in the U.S. Uh, that uh, tap into this loony ideas about freedom. In the Northeast, you don't have it. I mean, there was always a, a clear understanding in New England and the Atlantic, Northern Atlantic states of the common good. Um, so I got a vaccination, okay, maybe, you know, I don't want it, but you know, if, I, if I know it may protect you, I'm, I've got to do it. And this loony freedom idea, no, I should be free to do what I want, <clears throat> is much more common in the South and in the Far West. Um, so then it's, it, it's revealed in all kinds of cultural differences between among the regions in the US. Where the looniness comes from in Europe, I don't know. I mean, I, I, mean I, I do know some people who don't get vaccinations do talk a freedom line in Europe. Um, I don't think of Europeans as being as loony as, uh, as people in Utah, <laughs> so. Yeah, I think at the end, we'll also have to see how much of it is uh, the news, you know, the, the role of media at the end of the day. Right. Um, to, to propagate these ideas, et cetera. Right. Yeah, so, okay, uh, this was a great discussion. What, what else do you suggest for reading if people want to read on these topics? Uh, <clears throat> Tim Wilson has a great book uh, called Redirect, R-E-D-I-R-E-C-T, Redirect, who has a lot of very interesting uh, uh, applications of social psychology to everyday life. My 
dear friend and colleague, Lee Ross, um, who recently died, has a book called The Wisest One in the Room. Um, he wrote it with Tom Gilovich. Uh, and it's, it talks a lot about cognitive processes and social processes. It's sort of the most relevant ideas in social psychology for, for everyday life, to be able to make wiser choices in everyday life. Um, what else? Um, well, to see how an idea, a set of ideas uh, in psychology grows from, you know, what many people would re regard as trivial little laboratory experiments to the Nobel Prize in economics, uh, read a book called The Undoing Project uh, by um, Michael Lewis. Uh, and it's about the collaboration between Kahneman and Tversky. Uh, first of all, their work on biases, and it explains how that, what that work shows and how it got done and how they worked together and how it shaded into uh, people's uh, choice behavior <clears throat> uh, uh, in ways that become fundamental to economics. I mean, it's, uh, so it's, it's you know, a great intellectual adventure told like an adventure story. He's a very, a very good writer. Those three ought to keep your, your, your listeners busy. <laughs> <clears throat> That's great. Okay, and and what's more coming from your side? Uh, what what what's happening nowadays? What's happening now? Well, uh, I'm imprisoned, like many people are who are older. Uh, but it's a very nice prison. Uh, <laughs> I I live in Tucson, uh, where I I claim that between Tucson and Ann Arbor, where I continue to live six months out of the year, uh, there's never a day when I am unable to dine outdoors. <laughs> what, I'm always living in a place where that's gonna be possible. <clears throat> so, and it's a very beautiful desert. Uh, I'll show you. Desert mountains. Um, wow, beautiful. That's the, that's the view from my study. That's the view I was able to watch while we were talking. It's, it's amazing. Actually, once I was reading your book, I checked some places and, and the views there, uh, they were amazing. Right. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for accepting the invitation, uh, giving your time to discuss uh, your impressive work. And I hope people will uh, read your book and enjoy th your long career and, mm -hmm. and the ideas that you have uh, shared. Thank you. I very much enjoyed the conversation as should be obvious. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm.